Hi, everybody, uh, and thank you. I guess I'm supposed to first thank Google uh, for making this happen, and in particular, uh, Chris Devana, uh, DeWitt Clinton, Leslie Hawthorne, and Tiffany Griffith for everything. And, uh, and ho hopefully this will be the first of a bunch of these things. Um, and I was suddenly told, I think I got tacked on at the beginning to say something, so I'll try to say something interesting. Um, yesterday I was at uh, Supernova trying to explain um, Creative Commons to a bunch of people who didn't really understand. And actually I was, I was with um, uh, Larry Page and Jamie in the green room at the Google Zeitgeist uh, in the UK. And um, as you know, Larry's been somewhat skeptical about um, some parts of Creative Commons. So I, I have a kind of a framework argument that I've been working on and I kind of want to test it on you guys to see if, if this works. And, and it stretches the metaphor a little bit too much, but, um, but sort of bear with me. But I, I don't know how many of you remember sort of the early days of the internet when TCP IP was struggling against CCITT and we were sort of fighting to make TCP IP um, the standard. And actually back then, before the internet, you had all these little islands of um, networking technologies and things weren't connected. So we had, you know, the Ethernet kind of connected the computers together and then once TCP IP became, uh, you know, sort of a, the standard, you were able to connect the computer networks together. And then when HTTP came out, you were able to connect all these separate sort of software services and sites together into the web. And actually in the talk that Larry and um, Sergey gave, they were saying that, you know, they were sitting there at Stanford and they could connect their first Google server to the internet and they were able to get people from all over the world to connect to Google without having bilateral agreements with everybody, which would have had to have happened if it were X25 and if we fail the um, fight for protecting the open internet might actually happen in the future. But, but, the, but the idea is that, that you have these kind of standards that get created like TCP IP, which enable a huge explosion of innovation and creativity both for for-profit and non-profit around these um, open standards. And I think that Creative Commons if you include the technology part of Creative Commons, what we're trying to do is to create, at least at the content and sort of culture layer, something very similar to TCP IP. And so similar to TCP IP, one of the things that's very confusing about Creative Commons is there's one part of Creative Commons, which is the people who wear the t-shirts, who, who, who you know, use t-shirts to, and we feel cool because we're part of a political movement that has a message. We want the world to be free. But there's another part of Creative Commons, which is the kind of keeping the, trains running on time, let's make it ubiquitous. We want Creative Commons in Nokia phones and in just about, we want it to be ubiquitous, right? Because the thing about TCP IP and the internet, you don't want to exclude certain people from the internet just because they don't agree with you. The whole point of the sort of small pieces loosely joined open internet is that everybody can participate and anybody can innovate. Even if you don't like them, you don't block them. You, you create tools that anybody can use. So in a sense, TCP IP and the technology part is politically agnostic. But on the other hand, you have to fight to try to keep the standards open. You have to fight to protect the process. So if you think about it, you have like the IETF, which is really not that political, but then we have this whole movement for the open internet. And similarly, I think at Creative Commons, we have two really important pieces that we, we work on. And as a community, we have to work on one piece, which is a technical piece, which is, includes the legal technical as well as the, the software technical, which is to make sure that everything works together, everything is compatible, and everything interoperates. And that part, I think, is actually should be relatively agnostic in terms of the politics. It should just, just should happen. And then there's a political part, which is to try to make the world more free. And you know, one of the things, and, and again, this is what we have a lot of arguments. I mean, I think there's two ways to look at this. You can look at it from the sort of free software foundation kind of view, which is here's what's free join us, you're either in or you're out. And that's a really important way to set up kind of the, the reference point for where we want to go, right? But then there are a lot of people who could never make that decision. If you are a record um, musician signed to a label and we're fighting with rights collections agencies to even get them to move an inch, um, they're not ever going to be able to make that leap. And, and, it's, and differently from software and from the internet, one of the things about the internet and ITF, there really wasn't that much legacy or history. The problem with the cultural stuff is that we've got years and years of history, we've got crazy laws, we've got big, huge incumbents who are trying to protect this stuff. So it's pretty hard to force people to make the jump from completely closed to completely open. And so one of the things that I think we're trying to do is trying to create a path 
from a completely closed world to a completely open world. Now, there are people who are mostly open already, like the educators, who shouldn't really even be considering non-commercial. They should just be going straight for open. And, but on the other hand, if you're talking to Hollywood, which we eventually want to get into all this, you, still, you have to start with some of our more restrictive licenses. The good news is, as far as we can understand from the data that we have, is year by year, if you look at the distribution of our licenses, they tend to become more free. So the theory is that you have, on the one end, a slightly restrictive license, the non-commercial sort of no derivatives license, and people enter there, but as they taste free, they become more and more free. So, so, th so this is an argument that you know, some people agree with, some people don't agree with, but, but our idea is that we want to provide a choice for everybody along the spectrum, the chain, from completely closed to completely open, assuming that open is going to win in the end and that people will, will, will travel along that path. And so anything that's pushing people in the wrong direction, we should fight against. But I think the idea is to create a platform that allows interoperability and to create a movement that pushes people from closed to open but to do that in a, in, a, in a rational and civil way. And so, so those are the two things, the movement and the, and the technology, and, and, and they're separate, and sometimes they get a little confused. And as we become more successful, we have people who are politically not very aligned with us. Um, I, I won't name names, but you know, I've had you know, people adopt Creative Commons licenses or adopt Creative Commons technology and have the community say, how can you let these guys use Creative Commons? Or how can you let these guys sponsor our conference and things like that? But that's not really the point. We want everybody using it. We want Republicans using it. We want you know, the Arabs using it. We want, we want everybody using it. And so, so we can't exclude people at the technology level. And so I think that's just a, a, another thing that we, sh we need to be aware of. So, so anyway, that's, that's my theory, and I would love to have hallway conversations with people to sort of pick at it and figure out whether that's the right framework. I, I realize that it's, it, it's not perfect, um, and I think somebody was suggesting that the software metaphor, I mean, is, 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 is slightly different. I, I see Michael there. I remember when I was on the Open Source Initiative Board, we had um, 500 licenses that called themselves open source. I think the, the Black, Black Duck people were saying that. At least I think we've been um, tough enough to prevent too much of the license proliferation, but some people are still saying six licenses is too many. But anyway, um, enough ranting. Uh, and so I look forward to hearing everybody's presentations today, and uh, thanks for showing up. Do I need to thank anybody else? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Representative. Um, and so if you want to get some coffee or whatever, we have uh, just a minute here. And uh, so he's going to be talking about the CC rights expression language. And uh, then we'll follow that up with a panel about uh, some current technology initiatives we have going on at Creative Commons. My name is Benedita. I am the Creative Commons W3C rep, and I've been working on the stuff we're about to talk about for quite a while, uh, mostly in the dungeons that make up the W3C working group rooms, right? Um, no, I, I kid, actually. All of the discussions for the last four years are all public. You can all go see the development of this technology. Um, CCREL is the Creative Commons rights expression language. It's how we express the rights that you know in the Creative Commons licenses. Uh, if you have any questions as I go along, this is gonna be a, a lot of material packed into 45 minutes of fun. Uh, if you have any questions, please interrupt me. This is work that the entire technical team at Creative Commons has done, and it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. There are three ways in which Creative Commons license information is represented, right? We like to joke about this, especially the technical people like to joke about this, that it's human readable, machine readable, and lawyer readable, and we think these are all mutually exclusive. So uh, the, the, way, the one way we're interested in right now, so here's, here's the human readable, right? Nice little icons that tell you, you can share this work, you can remix this work, and you should also uh, give credit to the people who created this work in the first place. Nice human readable. Here's the detailed lawyer readable version of that with all of the caveats and all the things you need to know if you're a lawyer and you're signing contracts. Here's the machine readable version of that, which I have to admit currently doesn't look a whole lot prettier than the lawyer version. Um, but what this says is Larry Lessig's blog is licensed under a Creative Commons license. The license is specifically, uh, you can't quite see it over here, but it's the uh, probably the attribution license. That's all this says. One big chunk of text. And when we started in 2002, and we told people, you know, when you license your web page under a Creative Commons license, you should put something in there so machines can understand that it's licensed under a Creative Commons license. This is what we told them. Well, oh, sorry. This, 
Let me tell you first why we're doing this. Why are we even have machine readability, right? And people ask us this, why, why do we need this? There's an icon, everything is beautiful. Well, in some bright future, we'd like to have the following things. We'd like to have programs that can answer simple questions as you copy and paste content from one application to another. First of all, what's the works license, right? You take some data, you move it around into Photoshop and, and whatnot. What is the license under which this content is distributed? Simple question. A little deeper, can I make use of this content for commercial use? And this is a question you would ask probably at the point where you're about to use the, you know, the work that you've created and you've handled a, a, a couple of components, you've merged a couple of components and suddenly you think, wait a second, am I allowed to use this for commercial use? Derivative works, can I even begin to create a derivative work and distribute it? And then finally, the, probably the most important part for our early adopters, the bloggers, right? How do I give attribution? So I'm told that I have to give attribution, I have to give credit to the person who created this work. How do I do that? Where do I link to? What's the, is it Ben or is it Benjamin Adida? Which one is it, right? And to specify that would be very nice from a machine standpoint, so that maybe it could be auto-filled in your blog. Right? So the idea is if we let machines understand a little bit of what's going on, then the programs will be a lot more helpful. The previous recommendation looked like this, and that's why it's in red, right? Because we weren't very happy with it even when we started in 2002. It said, you have an HTML page. Uh, we don't really know how to put any structured, meaningful, machine-readable data in there, so let's put it in an HTML comment. That big chunk of XML that you saw earlier, Let's put that inside an HTML comment. Brilliant, brilliant idea. We're still suffering the pains of that. <laughs> Obviously, not something we wanted to have for the long term, but as it turns out, the problem was quite complicated. And there were a lot of other folks working on how you can add some kind of meaning, some kind of machine readability to the existing web, to the HTML web. So the problem, of course, is if you put stuff in comments, parsers don't always see it. Comments get stripped out by various tools at various times. Uh, certainly humans don't see it, so what might happen is you add a Creative Commons license, you add the XML, and then later you change the Creative Commons license, you point to a different one, maybe you upgrade to version 3.0, right? But you forget to change the RDF XML that was in the comment. That happens all the time. So not, not so good for humans, very easy to screw up, right? You've got this really big chunk of XML inside a comment, nothing telling you whether it's even well formed, right? If you've closed all your tags correctly. And of course, you saw that massive chunk of text to just say, this is the license. That's a little verbose. So this year, we're introducing the Creative Commons Rights Expression Language. And the Creative Commons Rights Expression Language attempts to address all the issues we have and let you express in HTML what the license is and further details about your work. Uh, and we actually also address this for things other than HTML, but given the time constraint, I'm gonna focus on HTML today, the web. This is what we say in the introduction to the paper that you can find on our site, and I'll give you the link. Compared to the previous recommendation, CCREL is intended to be both easier for content creators and publishers to provide. This is important to realize all the players here. There are publishers. They need to publish information and say, this is the license for my content. So we want to make it easier for them. That's one, right? We want to make it easier for also user communities and tool builders to consume that information, to extend that information, because you can apply Creative Commons licenses to lots and lots of different existing files and types of information, but there are many more in the future we don't know about. So we need to make it extensible in some way. Uh, and of course, easy for people to combine and redistribute. So you combine a couple of items under a Creative Commons license and you want to redistribute the result, we need to make that process easy in some way. We think we've accomplished that with CCREL. And of course, we, you know, we're hoping to get a lot of feedback from you today and in the next few weeks and months. The first thing we do with the Creative Commons Rights Expression Language is we think about abstract notions. We don't think about actual markup and angle brackets and whatnot. Let's just figure out what the concepts are that we need to express, right? First, we need to describe works, the things you produce. And second, we actually need to describe the licenses that we have so that you can answer questions like, 
does this work have a license that includes the right for me to use this for commercial purposes, right? So I need to describe the work and the license under which it's under. The work properties are pretty straightforward, right? What's the title? What's the license URL? Who do I give attribution to? What's the name and what's the URL? Where does it come from? Meaning if this is a derivative of some other work, it would be nice to know what that other work is. And CC plus, which I will let Nathan explain a little later. So that's the work. That's how you describe the work you have. And you should probably at this point think, well, I can come up with a lot of other fields I'd like to add to my work. This is kind of constrained. And if you think that, then you're right. And that's why we picked a framework and worked with a framework that allows you to add as many other fields as you want and still have all of our tools function correctly. Now the licenses, there's a whole bunch of ways that we can describe them. We describe the things they permit, the, so they allow you to redistribute content, the requirements they make of you, you have to display the license under which it, it's, it's uh, distributed, and the things they prohibit you to do. For example, if you have a non-commercial license, you can't do this for commercial purposes. Um, we, what's the attribution URL doing here? Huh, typo, Never mind. Okay, there is no attribution URL. Uh, the jurisdiction, that's really important. If, if you're in the US, you may not have seen this, but we have extended this to how many jurisdictions now? Like 45, 45 jurisdictions, lots of different legal systems. The same license has to be ported in, in to all these jurisdictions. Uh, a day when it's deprecated, we have versioned all the licenses. So 3.0 is the latest version we have. And of course, a pointer to the detailed legal code because that's what actually applies, right? That's the law that actually applies. Okay, and I know some of this is a little bit, you know, it's a little bit tedious, but what I want to make sure of is that if you have any questions, you raise your hands, right? There should be enough time. I have until 10.30, right? Uh, there should be enough time to, for, for questions, so don't hesitate. You might have more questions in about two slides, but. So, great, we have all these abstract concepts. How do we express them in HTML? What are the design principles we should have for expressing them in HTML? Well, the first design principle is the idea of visual correspondence. And I'll explain that in a second. But at a high level, it means that what you see on the screen corresponds to what the machine is telling you, what the, what the program is reading. So what you see, what the human sees, corresponds to what the machine sees. Don't repeat yourself. If you have one link for the human and one link for the machine, chances are you're going to make a mistake. So ideally, you express the link once. Remix friendliness. This is something where when we started, people didn't quite understand this as much, but now that we live in a world where it's web widgets and widget this and widget that, everybody understands what that means, right? Whatever we do better be compatible with the idea of grabbing chunks of HTML from various sources and putting them together in an iGoogle or, in or my Yahoo or whatever you want to do, right? Extensibility and modularity. Well, that's, you know, big words to say, you should be able to add your fields, right? You should not be constrained to the types of works we envisioned today in 2008 for licensing to license under Creative Commons. If you have additional ways to describe your work, that should be doable. So let's dig into that. The technology that we're using is called RDFA, which is RDF in attributes, in HTML attributes. That's what the A stands for. If you don't know much about RDF or if you've heard scary things about RDF, how many people have heard scary things about RDF? Come on, admit it. Sorry? Well, you can't be that old then. <laughs> uh, how many people don't know anything about RDF? Okay, great. So we, um, more or less, and, 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 and the other, so everybody else, everybody else loves RDF? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, RDF means resource description framework, which is, again, three big words that you can forget right away. You don't need to know what those. I'm going to give you the primer you need uh, to ideally describe RDF if you haven't heard of it and uh, soothe you if you've been scared before. The idea is that there's so much data on the web. Here's a web page of a guy I work with, Yvonne Herman. He's become our mascot for these slides, so he appears in every talk. Uh, and on his web page, there's a lot of data. 
but your web browser doesn't know anything about that data. And your address book doesn't know anything about the fact that there's a phone number and an email address and a mailing address and all of this stuff up there. There's data here. You just can't get at it without parsing it yourself. Here's Craigslist, right? There's a lot of data here. But if I want to make a nice little spreadsheet of all the Craigslist items that all the apartments in the area that I can afford, I can't do that, right? There's no, I mean, I can do that, but I have to do it all manually. But there's data here, and they know the structure on their end, and if they could express it in some way, then maybe it could be a lot more useful to me. There's data here in Flickr, right? There's the license, there's the camera, there's the settings on which you took the photo. There's all sorts of interesting data. In this case, it's a little bit better because some of it's actually embedded in the image, uh, in the EXIF data, but a lot of it is not. The tags are there, but again, if I want to copy this to my iPhoto or whatever, or Picasa, and have all that information come along, you have to write a, some kind of custom tool to do that. But the data's there. If only we could get at it. And here's the program for this today. There's data there. And I don't think there was an iCal link, but in any case, if you wanted to add this to your calendar, it would have been really nice if you could right click or drag and drop or something. The data's there and you can't get at it, right? So you have a whole bunch of people working on this thing called the data web, or some people call it the semantic web, but I like to call it the data web. And there's a whole bunch of people working on the human web, which is the web that everybody knows and loves. And what we're doing is we have this chasm where you have on one side a document that is for humans, and a document, on the other hand, a document that is for machines. And those two documents are maintained separately, they're distributed separately, they're two different document types, they're usually read by two different tools. That's wrong, it's not going to work. It's not going to work because what we need is we need to go from a browser that looks at a page and sees this. I see a headline, I see a subheadline, I see italics, I see text, and I see four links. But actually, what I want the browser to understand is that there's a title there, there's an author there, there's a publication date there, there's an abstract there, there's three tags and a copyright license. I want the browser to understand that. And if I can get the browser to understand that, I'm a good deal of the way towards actually having machines be that much more useful. So there's a gap and we want to close that gap and that's what the RDFA technology is about. RDFA, just so you know, has been a work in progress at the W3C over the last four years. We are in the last throes, I hate to use that phrase, in the last throes of getting it through to recommendation. Uh, it's something that Creative Commons has worked on but a lot of other folks have worked on it too because it's for more than just Creative Commons. So let's get back to those principles. Let's really make them precise. Visual correspondence means what? It means that if you have an article here at, uh, I think this is Nature Preceedings. Nature has just published a, uh, an online journal where you can publish preliminary results right away. And it's under a Creative Commons license. Visual correspondence means that if I have the title there and I can point to it, I know that's the title right there. And if I have a listing of five different items on the page, when I'm pointing to the first item, I am able to extract the data for that item. So there is a way to map what I see to the corresponding machine data. That's really critical uh, if you want to actually do things with that data. So here's a uh, life sciences blog where you have a lot of proteins and genes that get mentioned at random times, right? Wouldn't it be great if the author could mark up that string, it says GCN4, it's a protein, and say this is a protein, and this is the URI that describes that protein. So that if you have a browser that's properly augmented, you can get contextual information right away. Right click and find out all the papers you have read that have something to do with that protein. And for that, you need the visual correspondence of being able to point to something on the screen and get at the data for it. Okay, that's visual correspondence. Point to the screen, get the data for it. Don't repeat yourself, a lot easier to describe. If we have a link to a Creative Commons license, the attribution license, and we change that link to the attribution non-commercial license, so that when humans click on that link, they go to a different license, we want the machine readers to follow. That's it. 
Don't repeat yourself. You change it once, it changes it for both humans and machine readers. Any questions so far? We've got visual correspondence. Oops. Visual correspondence and don't repeat yourself. Yeah? Who's sleeping? Oh, that's the wrong question. Who's not sleeping? Okay, good. Uh, remix friendliness. This is really important to Creative Commons. If you've used our site, which I'm guessing most of you have, you go pick a license and you get a chunk of HTML. And then you copy and paste that chunk of HTML into your, I don't know, MySpace, maybe, right? Or wherever you paste it. So whatever we do has to be part of that chunk of HTML. And it has to be self-contained. Because there's no way, we're not going to be able to have a second file that you put on your site. We're not going to be able to modify the header of your HTML page. We're not going to be able to do any of these things. We need it to be such that you grab that chunk of HTML, you paste it into your site, and you get, don't repeat yourself, visual correspondence, and everything in that chunk of HTML. Here's another reason why you need that, right? I Google widgets. If you control just a widget, a part of the page, you need to be able to carry all of the information, all of the metadata you want to carry with you along in that widget. So there you have it, the four principles, right? The, oh no, sorry, that's three principles, there's one more. Extensibility and modularity. This is something that's a little bit more subtle, but very, very interesting. Here's part of my Flickr stream. If I express as much data as possible on this page, if there's the title, the photo, the license, the t date it was taken, etc., then extensibility and modularity means that you can have different applications looking at different slices of that data and still functioning correctly without me having to target each application. So I express the data once, all the data fields once, and I get a newsreader that can pick up just the titles and the dates of my photos because that's all it cares about. A newsreader just cares about titles and dates, right? And a link, ideally, a link to the photo those two fields. With the same data, not by targeting a different application, with the same data, you could have a digital photo frame that's looking just for photos, right? And you can have an asset management program that's looking for everything. I want to suck in all the data, the license, the photo, the everything, so I know all the digital assets that I have. I express the data once, and I get these overlapping applications that can function in sort of this loosely coupled way. I don't have to target each application individually. I just express my data in a fine-grained way, and then the applications pick and choose the fields they want. Does that make sense? Yes? No? All right. I should shut off the internet for three seconds. <laughs> that would be really like, what? Yes, it makes sense, yes. Um, what does it mean for Creative Commons? For Creative Commons, it means that if you're at Flickr, we can have an application, yes, cute dog. Everybody look up, cute dog on the page. Yes, oh, now you're paying attention. Uh, it means that if I have an application that looks for Creative Commons licensed stuff, I can have an image, and I, I notice that's a Creative Commons licensed item. I can have a song at Magnitude, and I don't have to know about songs ahead of time. I can still say, aha, that's another Creative Commons licensed item. Because I get this modularity and extensibility where they can add fields about audio, they can add fields about video, they can add fields about whatever, I can still pick up the Creative Commons license fields and make partial sense of what's going on. Whether it's a video at Blip that's licensed under Creative Commons license. Again, we don't have to foresee all of these things. The technology allows us to express the fields individually and pick out the ones we want. All right, let's start looking at some angle brackets. I gave you all the principles. We need to see how this works. The web is very bland. All the links you have are plain links. If I link somewhere, you don't know if that link means that you know, this is a license for the site, or it's my friend Nathan, or it's somebody I hate, or it's my favorite 17th century author. You don't know what that link means. So let's add some flavor to the link. Let's give it flavor, right? This is what the HTML looks like to start with. And this is how we give it flavor. We just label that link. We say the relationship expressed by that link is a license relationship. We can do that 
because license is a reserved word in HTML and rel is an existing attribute that lets us express how we, what that link actually means. So we already do this, right? If you get the HTML from our site, you already get rel equals license. And those characters in red are the only things we added. So that's a lot less verbose than that crud you saw earlier, right? And also, if you change the clickable link, then of course you're changing the machine-readable link. And for a machine to parse this, it's fairly straightforward. You go down and you see, aha, rel equals license. That expresses a license relationship between the current document and the target document. Now I understand. This is a copyright license. It's not a 17th century author. So we like to represent that as an, a graph, right? Some kind of diagram with these two nodes that are basically the URLs, my blog, or in this case, Alice's blog, the Creative Commons license, and an arrow between them. So far you're thinking, yeah, I can grok that diagram, no problem, they're gonna get a little more complicated, but we, we gotta start easy, right? So far, so good. So now we know how to add flavor to links. But what if we have text, right? This is the blog post that Alice has, and it has a title and it has a, an author. So let's add some flavor to that. Again, I don't know what this is, this could be, uh, you know, the abstract, or it could be the title, or it could be the author name. I don't know. So let's add the following markup. We use the property attribute. You don't have to remember all of it. The paper describes it in great detail. But the property attribute is for marking up text, whereas the rel attribute was for marking up links. Now, who's confused right now? Who, is there something on this slide that's confusing? DC. Yes. Who said that? Great. Thank you. Why DC? I said rel equals license. Why don't I just say DC, you know, property equals title, property equals creator? Where, what the heck is this, you know, is this like DC Comics? Like what, what is DC, right? <laughs> so it turns out that license is a reserved word in HTML, but there are no such reserved words for title and creator. We could start to come up with a whole bunch of reserved words, but at the end of the day, this idea of having a central definition of every possible concept in the world may not be so scalable, right? We, the, the web does not run on one computer, and so maybe we should have concept definitions by various different communities and various different groups. And of course, there's another question. When you say title, what do you mean? Do you mean the title of a work? Do you mean a job title? Do you mean something related to real estate? What version of the word title do you mean? So I, like I said, license is a reserved word, title is not. So let's import this concept from somewhere, right? Somebody must have defined the concept of the title of a work. Turns out it was not DC Comics, it was Dublin Core, and Dublin Core is DC. So let's import DC. The DC vocabulary is located at this URL. We're on the web, so everything is on the web, even vocabularies. And uh, it defines a whole bunch of concepts, like title, creator, et cetera, et cetera. So let's import that vocabulary. Here's how we do it. Uh, okay, hold on. There we go. This is the ugliest markup you're gonna see. XMLNS colon DC. It means XML namespace, DC equals that URL. What that means is in that div, in the HTML, whenever you see DC colon, we mean the concept defined by Dublin Core. Good, so now that we've imported the vocabulary and now that we've added property equals DC title, DC creator, um, this is what it looks like. That's still, maybe this is still better. This is what it looks like, fantastic. We've expressed the title and creator and this is what the graph looks like. What's important to realize, the only thing you need to remember about this graph, this diagram, is that the arrows are still labeled with the full URLs. In this world of RDF, what I'm giving you here is a very quick RDF primer without saying the word too often. Every label is a URL. And the reason why every label is a URL is because it's a nice way to go discover more information about it. If I go get that URL, the one that represents the title concept, I get a whole bunch of additional machine readable data that tells me what the label is in a nice human readable way. This is the title of a work that tells me what kind of nodes it expect at the start and end of the arrow. This is a document and this is a person. Uh, no, in this case, this is a piece of text. For the creator, it's a person. And all sorts of other things. So if we define concepts by grounding them in the web, where every concept, the title, 
the creator, the license, etc., is a URL, we get this nice distributed system for defining vocabularies, for defining concepts that we can reuse, that we can reuse granularly one field at a time, and that we can dis you know, auto-discover, basically. Any questions? Yes? Um, do you guys have a tool for showing these graphs of your semantic uh, products? Uh, we don't have a tool for showing the graph. We do have tools that let you uh, show a description of the graph, so then it would be just a visualization project. But I can, I can actually, well, why don't I just do that right, right, actually, hold on. Yeah, let me do that right now. Live. I will, uh, here's a little bookmarklet we have called get n3. N3 is the notation three. It's a way of writing graphs as like uh, representing all the arrows, subject, predicate, object. And then if you go to my web page, which has some RDFA in it, and you click get N3, and you get a little warning that says I need to, you know, boom, you extract all the triples from my page live. So if you'd had a little bit of visualization, you could render that as, an, as a graph. But, you know, it's just a resource constraint. Does that, does that make sense what I just did, by the way? I literally went to my site, clicked that bookmark, which was JavaScript, which went through my page, extracted all this RDFA, and just gave it to you. It, it's describing, you're not seeing it very well here, but it's describing uh, the arrows. Where does it start? What's the label on it? Where does it end? Each one is a triple, right? Three, three values. So Benedita hash me has as homepage, ben.adita.net, as name, Benedita. Here's my email address, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Yes. Sorry. So what? What Well, this can be interpreted by a machine, right? I can get this into my address book. I can get this in if there's information about the projects I'm working on. People can find common interests automatically. You know, you can get your browser to flash a pop-up and says, "Oh, Ben's interested in cryptography, just like you are." You know, things like that, and all, whatever whatever your heart desires, really. Right. That's a very good point. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, the question is, uh, since we're talking about the Creative Commons context, is this DRM? Is this digital rights management that we're talking about? Now, uh, so uh, thanks for the softball, by the way. Uh, <coughs> both of you over there. Right? Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, at Creative Commons, we've always said that we express rights. We don't enforce them, right? And in fact, we uh, are very careful to say that if you were to use Creative Commons works in a DRM setting, you would have to be very careful to support all the rights granted to you under copyright, like fair use, et cetera. Uh, the point is, here we're just expressing rights, and what we're expecting is an environment, an ecosystem, where you're informed of your rights, not where you're blocked if you try to do something, because frankly, we, I, I don't, I, I'll speak for myself, I don't believe the machine will be able to know exactly what your rights actually are. So you can, you're notified of your, of your rights, you're notified of the things you can do, of what you should do to give credit, and then it's your responsibility to do the right thing. What's the follow-up? <laughs> Um, you know, I could, I could list a few ideas I have about this, but I actually have taken, and this is going to sound like a cop-out, but it's true, I've taken a, a sort of a principled stance of saying, I'm not going to tell you what I think this is going to yield, because the whole point of this technology is that it can yield whatever you want it to yield. You want to add extra fields, you want to have a different way to interpret those fields, go for it, right? And I don't want to limit in any way the design of this technology with whatever I, I envision for the future. So, like I said, partially a cop-out, but 
it's really not up to me, right? Yeah. Just to follow up, this is less of a question, more of a point about RDF. Uh, the, the point about what, why it's better in HTML, it's not only that you can kind of import it into interesting things, it allows for kind of sophisticated querying down the line. If yeah. You build stuff that, you know, or Google, but you could do something, give me all the remixable photos made in 1999 by this person and, and do it now. And, and that's a semantically meaningful query to an engine where it was. That's right. And so the, qu the, the point was you can start to query the data in interesting ways given this RDF technology. And that's absolutely true. What's, what's important to realize is that this builds on top of years and years of very interesting work uh, by different folks at the W3C, uh, some of which will take years to realize, some of which will never be realized, and some of which I think is now within reach. Uh, and in particular, the point was about querying data. So let's say you've browsed a whole bunch of pages and your browser has picked up all of this data as you go along, which is really not that hard to do because it's right there, it can be parsed, it can be indexed, etc. Then you can start to ask questions and say, out of all the articles I've read, who are the authors of the blog posts written last year who, have, who share interests with me? You can ask questions like that about the data you've seen, and that's pretty exciting. Any other questions? Yeah. I, I, I didn't hear it. What? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we do. That's what the uh, that's what happens on our website. And if you actually enter extra information, like who to give credit, there's a little extra link on the site where you can say, uh, "I want to enter my name and how to link to me, etc." It puts all that in the chunk of HTML, and all you have to do is copy and paste it. That was one of the important design requirements for the technology that we be able to have that chunk of HTML be entirely self-contained. Because if we're telling people, well, paste this and then download this file and make sure it's in the same directory and also make sure you configure Apache, what? You configure what? Right? So that's, that's an important point. And absolutely, we have those tools and we hope to make more. Uh, I hope other folks for other vocabularies will make more. So, you know, uh, the FOF vocabulary, which is for defining people and friends, friend of a friend, FOF, uh, it would be nice if we had a little generator where you could list your friends, et cetera, and boom, get a chunk of HTML you put on your page, and there you go. You have your, your social network on your web page, and you don't have to re-enter it 20 different times for, you know, Facebook plus plus or whatever. Any other questions? All right. A little bit more, and... Uh, I think we're actually running on time, which is kind of shocking. Um, a few more things just to let you know, because some questions might start coming up in your mind and say, well, what if I have multiple blog posts on a page, which happens all the time, right? If I have title and creator twice on the page, what does that apply to? Well, RDFA has a solution for that too, and that is we use an extra attribute called about that says, whatever is inside this div is about this particular piece of content. So you don't have to remember all of this, but just to let you know, you can have different items on a page and you can describe different items. Is that clear? Yeah? All right. And this is what it looks like, right? You have two different items, each with a title and a creator. It's good when you, if you end up writing RDFA to think about this diagram approach to the data because it's, there is an abstract representation here that you're serializing as HTML. So sometimes it's good to have that diagram in your mind. What if you have a blog post and inside that blog post you have an image? You know, Here's Alice, if you've been following the storyline here because there is a storyline behind the blog post titles and Alice says the trouble with Bob and the trouble with Bob is that he takes much better photos than I do and uh, here's a photo he took of a beautiful sunset. It would be nice if I could label that photo and say, this is the title of the photo. It's not the title of my blog post, it's the title of the photo. So I can add another about over here. And at this point, I don't know if I can, you see that there's this about here on this, on this div, and then there's this about here on the outer div. And so what this means is that the top level about applies for these fields at the top. And then on this inner div, this about takes over and applies for all the fields inside it. So because we we're trying to make this as HTML friendly as possible and only using attributes, you're able to basically use the structure of your HTML to define new items you want to describe. And that's what it looks like as a nice diagram. 
actually, I don't have the really complicated diagrams. I, I cut them out since I didn't have too much time, but it's important to note that you can go deeper than just one layer. There are ways of saying, I work at a company named you know, Creative Commons, and Creative Commons is located at this address, which has this street number and this zip code. So you can go very deep in the graph using RDFA. I just didn't want to try to squeeze that into 45 minutes. All right, so what's the conclusion? If you've been thinking about the fact that there's a human web, you know, the web that has billions and billions of web pages and that's not going away anytime soon, and the fact that we're trying to build a data web, you come to the conclusion pretty quickly that it's only going to work if we bridge them somehow. In fact, if we grow the data web out of the existing web. There's an important concept here in RDFA which can, you know, slip under the radar. If you're going to build the data web in a web-friendly way, then you have to let anybody create a vocabulary. You have to let people mix and match vocabularies, concepts, right? The title from Dublin Core, the, the homepage from FOF, the license from Creative Commons, and potentially other fields you come up with. I didn't have time to show you these examples of mix and match, but you should be able to do that. You should be able to pull in fields from whoever wants to define them. And that's distributed extensibility. That's the data web in an actual web-friendly manner, right? You can find out more about RDFA at rdfa.info and at the wiki. It's a, there's also a mailing list that you can find from there if you want to join and find out more about it. And you can find out more about CCREL and how it uses RDFA and a lot more details about this at our website. That's actually, I wrote cc.org, but obviously you have to write creativecommons.org slash projects slash ccrel. And if you have any questions, we have a wiki for the Tech Summit. And I actually have five minutes to take any additional questions. Shocking. Question. Yeah. Uh, outside of the wave, you're saying. So the question is, if I have a wave file which doesn't give me any opportunity to embed any metadata in it, how do I say anything about it? How do I pr express a license? Um, one way to do it is using that about attribute that I showed you earlier. Over here, I use the about attribute on a photo, on a JPEG. You could put your wave file in there and say this wave file, which has title whatever and I'm the, I, that I created is licensed under this license. That would be that would work. It would be a little bit um, weak in the sense that if that wave file ever gets distributed in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion or in a way that's not rooted in your web page anymore, it's hard to find that information again. So. That's a very good point. The, the, the place where RDFA and microformats intersect is rel equals license and on certain of the design principles. There's a lot of commonality there and then there are some differences. Uh, if you put rel equals license and you have an about attribute, in RDFA that's gonna be interpreted as you're talking about the wave file uh, because you have that about attribute. If you don't use the about attribute, meaning you're not using RDFA, then it is exactly the same thing as the microformat, basically. So if you start using RDFA attributes, you're using RDFA, basically. Uh, but what I wanted to point out is there's another section in the CC rel paper, which I strongly recommend you take a look at for more strongly binding together these media files with their descriptions. Uh, I won't describe it here, it would take a 15 minutes, but it's really interesting and you should check it out. Yes. Right, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, so whenever you use text in H using the property attribute and you, you know, if you go, let me just, if you, use, if you do this basically, the uh, RDFA will inherit 
the language defined in your in whatever your HTML file is. So if you say US English in your HTML file, we'll carry that through to the actual machine readable version. If you want to express multiple version, you absolutely can do that with uh, XML lang that says the language now is French, right? And then we'll pick that up too. Yeah. Any other questions? No? I have, hold on. Let me try one more thing. Cute puppy. Any other questions? <laughs> yes, it worked. Right. So there is a, there's a worry that's often expressed that, oh my God, my page is going to be huge and, oh, I'm sorry. The question is, there's a lot of, of extra characters there for the semantic markup and what's the effort involved in doing that? And I'm guessing you're worried about the actual file size too, is, or not really? About adoption, right. You, you, you want to answer that for me? Yeah, go for it. Oh yeah, hello. No. I work on the Drupal project and uh, as a core developer. And one of the things that we're doing to push push forward these technologies is we're taking the content management systems that people are already using on the web, and we're integrating these kind of markup tools into the output that these systems are making. So. If you right now have something that is a location module on your site that just allows you to put in an address, we're converting that over to be a location module that is actually marking up the address with the additional semantic markup technology. So as long as you're continuing to move forward with newer technologies for your actual content management, then a lot of this is going to transparently be added to the, to the content that you produce. And that, I think that's that's great to have Drupal folks saying that. And I take that as an RDFA endorsement, right? Uh, <laughs> Let's talk. They're, they're a yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're platform neutral. I understand. <laughs> uh, the point being that there's, uh, there's a lot of tools that are going to help you do that. And what we wanted to do in the design is let allow two different things. First of all, make it easy for people who use HTML templates and things like Drupal and other systems to mark up the template once and then of course have it work. So there's no separate file, there's no separate delivery mechanism. If you're ever delivering HTML, it's trivial to deliver RDFA on top of that. And then second, there's this sort of a wizard-like approach where you go through the Creative Commons wizard, you get a chunk of HTML that you can paste into the footer of your blog or something. And we're hoping that other folks who you know, have a chunk of HTML to paste in your site like YouTube and other uh, folks who do that will also carry some metadata along with it since they can, right? They can just add a little bit of markup and do it. Uh, the answer is humans can mark this up. It is an effort. I expect that most of the RDFA markup will be machine generated with human input, basically. Yes. Yeah, uh, I think I, I think that means I've gotten that question every time I've talked about RDFA. So that's great. Uh, the question is, sorry, uh, this seems ripe for spam. Uh, yes, absolutely. You can use any technology that makes it machine readable for spam. The advantage that we have with RDFA is that we encourage people strongly to use what's already human visible as part of the machine readable data. So the spam techniques you're using to detect existing visual spam can also be used to detect this stuff. And if not, if you're using RDFA, there are ways to use RDFA in that, so that it's not visible to the user. Like when you want to override a predefined date to be a machine readable date, for example, then I th it's actually trivial for a Google or anybody else to say, huh, this looks very spammy because the person has a lot of embedded data that's not visible to the user. It's a lot easier to detect than a one point, div, one point size text, one point font, which a lot of spammers use, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Totally different question. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, it sounds like I can claim that I own Larry Lessig's blog or, you know, I can make all sorts of claims, especially, I'm guessing, using the about attribute, right? So I say Lessig, Lessig's blog is, you know, 
its title is crappy blog, right? I could say that on my page. Anybody could say that on their page. And I think you have to trust the provenance of that information in the same way that you trust the provenance of any information on the web. So who's making that statement? Oh, well, Ben is making that statement? Well, he doesn't know anything. You, you know, why would I trust any statement made on his page? So it's important to realize that just because it's machine readable doesn't mean it's solved anything about reputation or, or you know, quality of source. You still have to use other heuristics to decide whether you trust that information or not. That's right. So it would not be surprising to me if, uh, as a start, any site that makes statements about other sites would just get ignored, basically. You only get to make statements about things on your domain. That's probably what would happen. Yeah. Anything? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, I don't share your uh, your principled stand against uh, imagining the, the future. <laughs> um, so um, let me offer mine. This is why I'm Jamie Boyle. I'm from Creative Commons. Um, I deal a lot with teachers, um, and teachers are um, have a bipolar attitude towards copyright law. Um, uh, half the time they completely ignore it, and the other half of the time they believe that they can't do anything, that everything they're doing is forbidden. But basically there's nothing in between. You know, it's completely, the, the distribution is all at the end. Um, and there are now wonderful uh, open educational resources, sites like OER Commons, stuff that CC Learn is, is working on, a, a lot of great stuff around the world. Imagine the teacher who doesn't want to have to try and understand what he or she is allowed to do, who just says, show me all the pictures of this particular nebula or this particular, um, this particular starfish that I can use and that I can print out and give to the entire California school district, right? And that person wants to be able to do that, but they don't even want to look at a Creative Commons license, which already we've tried to make easy. They just want that to be just automatic. So it's like, can I do this? Will my tools just tell me this as I do it? Will it just fill in everything? And the thing is, this is what people don't realize. Google relies, Google's existence relies on a set of default rules that make it presumptively okay for Google to go through and read web pages and say, this is what the web page says. The presumption could be the other way, then Google would be impossible, right? I mean, that's the, there is a, a legal substrate to all of the tech that we use all the time. So the, the hope for this is, this is step 2.0 in that legal substrate. Imagine what we could build if you never had to think about the law when you were doing sharing. Just give me the stuff I can use. Show it to me, right? So it seems to me that that's, I think in science, it's maybe even more exciting than that. But for education, it seems like that's one of the key things. And I know we're about to talk about that in the next session. But I just wanted to flag that it's not just the puppy that should make you excited. <laughs> that puppy is cute, though. No, that, thanks, thanks, Jamie. Is, I'm over the time. So if you have any questions, catch me at lunch or anything else in, on email. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ben. Um, so now we have a panel of some people from CC who are going to uh, talk about uh, some current technology initiatives we're doing across the organization and um, sort of set the stage for some stuff we're doing. And Mike Linksfair, our vice president, is going to uh, moderate that panel. Uh, I'm, I'm moderating the panel primarily because Nathan is speaking. He's the CTO. Um, but we're going to have uh, three three speakers about current developments. We kind of have three divisions right now. Uh, Creative Commons, which does the infrastructure and cultural stuff. Uh, Science Commons was started in 2005, I think. And uh, then CC Learn, which is our new division. Um, and they're all doing interesting tech projects. So let's start off with Nathan. Uh, as Ben mentioned, the question was brought up during the last session about um, how a layperson could generate CC REL or RDFA metadata to put into their document. And Ben mentioned the uh, expanded information that you can add when you select a CC license at creativecommons.org. And I think it was just about a month ago now, we turned on, this used to be all hidden um, under a you know, provide more information um, disclosure that you could add. Uh, and now we're actually showing it by default and we're really trying to encourage people to add this information so you can add the title of your work, how you want to be attributed, and um, where people can go or to find out more about more permissions for your work for something we're calling CC+. Um, if you actually add this information to your HTML, 
or add it here in the HTML and you add it to your page, when you click through the page, the uh, deed will be annotated um, to give you some more information. So this is an, an example for Magnatune and uh, maybe I'll show a live demo here in a second uh, and tempt fate. But basically um, this, this portion here with the plus sign um, was all added based on the metadata that Magnitude embeds in their pages. You can't really see it on here, uh, which we'll do a demo, but they also include the attribution information on their page. So we actually provide some copy and paste attribution information now um, that reads how they want to be attributed and gives you a really easy way to include the license link and the link back to the work um, uh, when you want to reuse, say, a song or something like that. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, well, f let me do a demo of that first. So um, if I go to magnitude.com or any, this is just one I happen to know has all their stuff marked up with um, CC Rel and I go and look at a particular album, uh, say Artemis, and uh, so they have the license link here. Um, when you click through this, our server is actually going to go back and look at the refer and check and see what sort of metadata is on that page. So when the deed comes up. Okay, I'm going to go back and talk about the other things uh, since we're on a schedule here and I'll come back and look at this in a moment. <laughs> um, so the other thing I wanted, so much better. Okay, thanks Epiphany. Um, so you can see here uh, the attribution information from that page was scraped and added to the deed and if I want to attribute that work I've got some HTML here that includes the reuse information uh, right there. Nathan, I have a question. Yes, Ashish, what is your question? Did, you, did Magnitude modify the link to the license? To That's a great the question. The question was, did Magnitude modify their link to the license? And the answer is no. It's a normal link. It does say rel equals license, like Ben described, but they also include other metadata. So we're actually going back and looking to see um, where you came from and uh, what metadata is in that page. Uh, oh. oh, yes. Okay, so the question is if it, if it includes metadata about multiple documents or multiple objects, such as maybe an image or something else, how do you know which one to show here? Um, so we apply a couple of different filters to this. First of all, we look and see which ones are under this particular license we're linked to. Um, and if there's more than one of those, we've just chosen, the default is that it's going to be the referring page. If, um, if there's more than one and neither of them, none of them are the referring page, we don't show this at all. So we try to kind of err on the side of conser more conservative side uh, about giving this advice. Uh, okay, let me open back up my slides. Um, okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit was um, the CC Learn Education Search project that we're working on right now. Um, a few years ago, we ran a prototype search engine at search.creativecommons.org uh, to demonstrate how you could look at what was then our recommendation for metadata to search just for CC licensed works. And this was before Yahoo first and then Google um, added CC search to their sites. So it was, just, it was never intended to be uh, a full production search engine or something you'd use every day. It was a prototype that we put together. And we're repeating that experiment um, now with education and, we're, and this time we're using the CC rel metadata to augment this full text search uh, using Nutch. So this lets us do things that you can't currently do um, well, this theoretical lets us do things that you couldn't currently do with, say, uh, Google or Yahoo CC search, which is, say, show me these images that are of a particular subject and that I can reuse in a particular way. Um, and we're doing this in, this in the CC, with CC Learn and Open Educational Resources because um, it provides us with a nice limited domain to kind of start and scope our crawl. And also there's a lot of organizations out there um, both as far as university OCW sites and organizations like OER Commons and other groups that are making a lot of effort to annotate stuff already. So we have a really rich set of metadata to work with. Um, this is sort of a, a little diagram of how we're doing this where we have, um, we have sources, whether they're Atom, RSS, or uh, OAI, PMH that come in and we aggregate them and throw everything in a triple store and then when we do our crawl, we get our URLs to crawl from that triple store 
and when we index it, we also re-index that metadata in Lucene so that we uh, have fast access to it. And then when we do this nut search, we actually can provide this sort of user interface where uh, you can filter by tag or by license. Did I see a question? Okay. So this is a project that's currently, um, we're currently still working on it and uh, we're doing some initial crawl work and some initial work. You know, this is an example of uh, um, MIT stuff we haven't coming in from chemistry. Well, I did, I did a search from chem, for chemistry last night and there's obviously a lot of holes on it still but we are able to do the license search. We're able to search um, for particular types of objects as well. So we hope to have this in a wider testing um, soon. Are there any questions? Uh, I guess will we go on do the other ones and then do questions? Okay. So with that, I will turn it over to Ashish. Well, right, or John? But John. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, I, I can and, and have talked for an hour or longer about what we're doing with technology at Science Commons. So I'm going to sort of race through a couple of the larger initiatives that we've got. But the main goal of Science Commons was to take on this task of how do you make the web work for science the way that it works for culture and for commerce. Uh, which is that we sort of take for granted that Google gives us accurate answers to questions about culture and commerce and that we can use Amazon and other vendors to acquire physical things using the network and neither of those things are actually very true for science. Um, I'm not going to do any demos but I have links on uh, the pages so that you can click through and look at them while I'm talking rather than me try to do this. So the, if you think about sort of the CC symbology and iconography, what do these things mean in science? Because they mean different things to scientists than they necessarily mean in the cultural space. So uh, this is an example of a science database. This is a chemistry database. It has structures and chemical formulae. Um, are these things creative works or not? Um, there are differences of opinion, uh, to put it mildly, about how these things need to be licensed. And so we've been working uh, to develop A, some lowest common denominator uh, legal options and B, to look at the implications of using things like share alike in that world. Um, we currently recommend a public domain approach uh, under this new CC0 tool in which you essentially say that in the context of science at least, if you want the interoperability of two databases, then licensing these things like software or culture is the, one of the worst things you can do. Because if you think the Wikipedia GFDL CC by share alike is difficult, um, wait till you look at 25 to 1,000 molecular biology databases with different terms of use. And given that your Google query itself is a data product, it is unquestionably difficult to start attaching terms of use to these databases. So this is the first place that we started looking in this space, at least technically for database integration, and it was driven by, in many cases, the search result itself being a derivative work or a, or a data product. The second thing that we did was build on the existing CC infrastructure, um, but not for digital things. So this is Creative Commons for DNA products, cells, bacterial vectors, uh, even transgenic mice. So you can go to this address and actually generate a Creative Commons style agreement, which is to say human readable, lawyer readable, machine readable, but the goal of this was to actually enable e-commerce for biological materials so that we can identify them when they're sitting in a refrigerator in a laboratory or at a biobank which is sort of like a greenhouse for these tools. And you get all of these great benefits and in many cases for example CC host turns out to be a great idea because the same thing that lets you track derivative works and family tree genealogy of copyrighted materials is actually really useful in tracking um, derivative works of biological materials which are just as important. So this is a place where both in CC0 and at uh, the Creative Commons licensing methodology, we've been able to take that underlying uh, rights expression language, uh, automated generation and metadata and reuse that in the science space. Um, the bulk of what I'm going to talk about comes from this, this idea of making the web work uh, at the data level. And so uh, this is a, uh, something we put together where we put some images from the Allen Brain Atlas into Google Maps. Um, you would be shocked how hard it was to do this. First, we had to break the rules of uh, the database involved, which did not want to allow any data downloads of their images. Um, second, we had to scrape the web pages where they showed the images because it was designed for single query individual user access, not machining. Um, and then we had to transform the data by reverse engineering it into an RDF compatible format so that we could actually put all this stuff together. Um, until this was done, you actually couldn't look at two images side by side from this $100 million science project and annotate them collaboratively. So this is how 
it's much easier to share information about what hotels we're staying in than the scientific information we're looking at. And it sort of propagates. This is you know, a, a classic science query in Google, which is uh, show me signal transduction genes and pyramidal neurons. Uh, think about this as give me putative drug targets for Alzheimer's disease. Because of the information formats that are, that are sitting in, uh, in which the science information sits and the legal barriers to transformation, your answer is read 189,000 papers. And what you really want is a list of genes that meet that, that meet that requirement. And so a lot of what we do is database reformatting, integration, and a lot of the best practices that are required to avoid having to go back and do the database formatting and integration. And, and we do all of this in a way that sort of it natively links to Creative Commons metadata, uh, whether that's on copyrighted objects, databases, or biological materials. And now the reason you would do this, and so and Ben referred to RDFA, this is a, a higher order of semantic web stuff called Sparkle. And this actually lets you write that query. And this is hideously ugly. And the reason I'm showing it to you is that A, it traverses four databases. So this is what we want Google to do instead of us, is to actually have enough information about the databases in a comprehensible enough format that you can actually traverse four of them. But that I, the idea is that the users can now start to transform these things into clickable HTTP links, which means that the second person runs the query from this interface instead of from the query interface. And just like when I got started writing HTML in you know, 1994, I wrote copies of other people's web pages where I just changed the things inside the tags. That operates now at the query level because no one really wants to look at the data in RDF or RDFA, really. The important thing is the query. And what we can do is begin to grow a powerful corpus of these links. And this is, again, getting at making the user-driven web something that works in science the way it works in culture and commerce. And there's a legal barrier as well as a technical barrier. Because if we don't have the right to transform these databases into these formats, all of these queries are illegal data products that violate what's going on. Even if we open up an endpoint and let someone at Pfizer click on that query, it may well be illegal if someone somewhere put a non-commercial license on a database. So the law and the technology are converging here in a way that makes things really hard to do. And last, you know, all of this depends on some sort of structure technically. It depends on unique names. It depends on ontologies and taxonomies. And this is going to be very important as the RDFA web and the, and the linked open data web come online. It's sort of who controls these namespaces. This is a coffee ontology, uh, which I like because it's a lot more comprehensible than the science ones. And you sort of see how stupid the computers are because you have to tell them that drinking coffee makes you feel awake and makes you feel jittery and that there are these things called people that might want to be awake but not to feel jittery. But there are really important rights associated technically with this stuff. If you want to do something interesting with an ontology, you have to have a right to make reference to it. Imagine if it were, if it were a, a licensing transaction to refer to someone's URL. Right? That's what licensing ontologies create. Because there's got to be a URL behind that idea of feeling jittery if a computer is going to understand it. And we have an open domain name system. What we don't have is an open domain name system for science and for semantics. It's scattered all over the place um, and, and no one really is worrying about persistence on it. But you have to have a right to refer to these things. You have to have a right to use the names. Um, you need to be able to refer to the piece of the ontology that you care about. I might like a piece of your ontology about coffee, but I might hate cream. So I want to throw away that part of it. I need to have the right to copy the piece that I want to use. I need the right to make extensions to it. I need to say, you didn't get detailed enough about coffee. I'm a coffee dork. I want to add classes that talk about fair trade and shade grown. If you don't have that right, technically, this whole web of data starts to break. And last, you need to be able to understand the right of integrity, which is, I would like to have a web in which I'm able to give you the right to add classes about shade grown coffee but I don't want you to add shade-grown coffee to my ontology and then label it as the same one I put on the web. And that's a very important right of integrity. So I've put up you know, my own name. Um, one of my Google gangers is actually my cousin John Wilbanks in Texas. He's a Flash developer. We'd like to have different personal ontologies. Uh, and then there's the Wilbanks family in South Carolina. We need to be able to distinguish technically between these things. And we need to be able to legally distinguish between who's allowed to do what. And all of this now ties back into things like CC RHEL and RDFA. Because as the web gets more machine readable, whether it's from the top down semantic web stuff I've been showing, or the bottom up semantic web stuff that Ben's showing, or micro formats, or tags, because it's going to come from everywhere. 
if we don't get the law right fundamentally in the, in the basis of this, uh, it's going to be prevented from coming together. And this was not a problem on the web because people weren't paying attention. So it was okay to do everything openly. But people are definitely paying attention to this now. And there are companies that are trying to get into this and lock it up. But none of those network effects from the technology are going to come together uh, if we don't get the law right at the very beginning. And with that, I'll stop. Um, you can click on the neurocommons.org site if you're a semantic web nerd and you want to see our URI recommendations. Um, you can run all of the things I showed you uh, on your computer. They're not demos. They're live. And you can find sort of the classic marketing level discussion of this at sciencecommons.org. Thanks. Hi. So I don't have any slides, so you all can enjoy the no signal. But um, what I'm going to talk about is a project I've been working on that started out as an interim project last summer called LibLicense. It's really a product for software developers. How many of you are software developers in the room? How many of you use software built by other software developers? <laughs> OK, so there's probably some interest. Uh, um, and how many of you use media files like MP3 or JPEG for, say, sound and photos? OK, great. So um, I, presumably then you all know that MP3 and JPEG are formats on the machine for sound and photos. And they also store some information about the sound and photo, like in a sound file, the title, the, um, the band who performed that track, and some more details, like the date. In a JPEG, the camera. Um, the shutter speed that that photo was just taken with, and uh, the time sometimes. But you can also store, we've uh, worked with a bunch of metadata standards organizations and sometimes just done it ourselves to create standards for adding license information and standardized author information and other metadata that relates to what you saw on the Magnitude page. So that Magnitude demo that Nathan did involves taking, going to the Magnitude webpage for uh, an album, going, and then clicking on a link to look at the license. But that relies, on the, that relies on being online. It relies on this looking at the web. It would be nice if you could do the same sort of extraction just out of the MP3 file itself. So that's what the metadata standards we have do. They let you store the metadata for the license inside the MP3 or the JPEG or the PDF. They let you say, here's where you go to buy more permissions if you want to, say, buy the rights to use it without attribution. Um, and we've ha published these on the wiki for ages, and they're, uh, they have a, a very slight amount of usage, let's say. One of the problems is that each of the formats has its own different standard for encoding this information, which is this totally boring technical point that makes software developers go to sleep, e makes even software developers go to sleep when you want them to cooperate. And so you want, the, you want that if you're using a photo viewing program, if your photo contains the license, it can show you a button that says, this is the license. Um, if it says, if the photo says, this is where you have to go to buy more permissions, it could say that in the software. But to support it in an MP3 file and a JPEG and in a Photoshop file and a PDF and so on, there's piles of standards. So last summer, we began to write with interns, and I'm uh, polishing up now, this library called LibLicense that if you're a software developer, lets you just ask, I don't care what type of file this is, would someone, play, would this library that I wrote, please tell me what the license is of that document? You know, a PDF, a JPEG, an MP3. Would you tell me, if you can, who, it is, who I'm supposed to attribute if I use it? Um, and that's, that's just sort of to smooth over this landscape. Um, so hopefully we can get some more software developers using it. It's under an open source license that allows it to be used in commercial products, in proprietary closed source commercial products, as well as open source products. And we, um, we also have bindings for the Python language. And there's a sample program it comes with that lets you just inspect a file on the command line on a Mac or Windows or Linux and type in license space the file name. And it'll tell you what it knows about that file. Just like an ID3 tag program for MP3s might say, I know the title and the artist and the year. Uh, so that's what LibLicense is for. And even if, so hopefully we want to get more software developers using it so that, you know, they can, they can know about it and the rest of you can not know about it and just benefit from it. Um, uh, yeah? Can, can you name some of the prominent open source content creation tools that are using LibLicense today? Uh, well, I'm going to be demoing some integration of it at OSCON, which is an open source conference in Portland. Um, there's, 
I don't think, well, so Inkscape has long had support for Creative Commons licensing, but in its own way, actually, not using liblicense. And it, it's sort of modeled upon there, the way they integrated it, I guess. Um, as far as viewing content, I'm going to be demoing having it added to the file browser, which I actually I demoed that at the GNOME Summit in November of last year. And um, I'll be demoing a photo viewing program that if you open a JPEG or a Photoshop file or whatever, it'll show the license information and it doesn't care. And that's the whole point, to make it easier for them. So that program is called Eye of GNOME. Nautilus is the file manager and there's another tool, Rhythmbox, is a music player we're targeting also. And that's using the Python language bindings um, and that, that'll be demoing in a month or two. Uh, I guess that's... That's a very good point, though, that we need uh, integration both at the production and consumption yeah. um, programs. Um, I just want to give a quick plug for another technology that we use. It has nothing to do with licensing, but it has everything to do with semantics. And every single one of these projects, or all of the CC's divisions use it. It's called Semantic Media Wiki. And you owe it to yourself to check that out. <laughs> We're sort of actively looking at how, to how do you stick Semantic Media Wiki on top of a big triple store uh, that you derive from a bunch of databases, because that's the human interface to edit this stuff, so. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully openly. Yeah. Do we have, I guess we have like one minute for another question, if anybody has any. This is the, this is the last panel that's really Creative Commons exclusive, so. So the question was if liblicense can be used to add metadata to a file that lacks it in addition to reading the metadata out of any file. And the answer is yes, to the extent that the file format can support whatever metadata you want to add, you can add it. Um, it also supports setting a default across your, setting a, a default preference so that you just say license is the way I usually license things. And it'll figure out what file type you're modifying, look up your preference and then store that. So uh, we have a 15 minute break now and then we're going to have a panel on digital asset management on the web and the desktop.